ladies tell you my favorite joke. This is really important. What is this? <laughs> now this is a dead one of these. Okay? Now that's my favorite joke because what's missing from this is the spark of life, the animating and guiding force that the old vitalists used to associate with spirit and soul. Um, although the mechanists won that battle, the vitalists actually were right, they were both right. Because this new science suggests that the emotional system in its entirety is actually the mechanism that underlie those vital functions. The, um, both the animating and guiding force that shows up as purposeful behavior in living systems, including us. So, my fundamental point to today is that there, um, we have this living system here, but the emotional system also points to some deeper, perhaps energetic or quantum component of identity that, thank goodness, a lot of people are talking about. You made my job a lot easier today, and that it's like a completed energy circuit between these two pieces without which life and sentience itself would not be possible. So, thank you. So, my basic message to you, and thank goodness people like Neil Thies and um, Moro and Michael have made my life a lot easier because they've talked about the underpinnings, the physiological underpinnings of spinal fluid and electrical circuits that I'm going to talk about the chemical level but that I don't have to emphasize that too much because we experience it through positive and negative emotion. So I'm going to use my little duality here. It's really a non-dual system of dancing opposites that positive and negative emotion actually reduce to. So if everything's working here, I've just introduced the new emotional vitalism, which is why I call this new science, because of the... Um, the fact that it is the mechanism within vitalism. So my foundational claim is that by virtue of this, all living creatures are, uh, experience hedonic qualia, a form of what we experience as pleasure and pain. But hedonic qualia are not just feelings. They come coupled with approach and avoid behavior. So it's double-barreled hedonic qualia that I'm talking about here. Uh, these qualia provide what Antonio Damasio called the proto-self awareness and the feeling of what is happening. So, I'm also going to suggest that um, it shows up in the pattern of behavior, uh, that hedonic behavior toward that which is beneficial and away from that which is harmful. This is a pattern that you see all across the evolutionary, up and down the evolutionary ladder. Furthermore, these double-barreled hedonic qualia are the coupled stimulus-response pair within uh, Pavlovian conditioning. So, for Michael and anybody that asks, how the hell can you train a flatworm, it's because they experience hedonic qualia and that there's a huge chemical and electrical machinery that gives rise to that valence. So, one more thing, even better yet, is that this core proto-self awareness comes in a both an autonomous me and a, and a social we. We'll talk about that. So, in sum, emotional sentience emerged as the very first form of perception. It delivers the feeling of something good or bad happening to me, along with the urge to do something about it. And even in the simplest creatures, it leaves behind a memory trace, an evaluative memory trace that leaves categories of good or bad experience. So I want to point out that those things that I just mentioned, sensation, uh, motor response, memory, are normally attributed to brain tissues, but now we know for a variety of reasons that uh, they go lower still. I want to suggest that it all happens at the cell membrane of, um, of simple, our single-celled ancestors and continues on in all the cells that signaling machinery um, of all of our multicellular organisms. And obviously there are these electrical circuits that are part of this chemistry, but the chemistry is very obvious. So, I want to suggest that this, the, the brains, the original membranes, the brains of the, of the cell are actually um, instantiating a little loop of mind. Michael just said the same thing. I was going to uh, refer to Moderata and Rebe um, Morella's view that cognition is, uh, well, they call it the 4E mind, I've added a 5th E, uh, the idea that mind is fully embodied in tissue 
It's embedded in the immediate environment. It's enacted through ongoing cyclic processes um, that it's extended to the degree that there can be adaptive learning, niche building, things like that. But I added the fifth, the evaluative, because it's all driven by hedonic qualia. The coupling runs the whole show. It's my argument. So how this shows up in the, I, um, you can see this in the molecular circuitry of the E. coli bacterium. This all happens on the membrane, and certainly it's got the little hairs, so there's the electrical stuff going on too. But there's this really beautiful little three-step control loop that's instantiated by the structure of the cellular membrane complex on the, on the cell membrane. It's got inside tails, outside heads, where it can compare the environment, this internal itself, to its not-self environment, and it sends a chemical signal when there's an imbalance, and that signal triggers a corrective response. So these are the, it's a very simple cybernetic loop that designers used uh, to design things, everything, control systems from thermostats to guided missiles and to robot brains. So I want to suggest that this is a really important little loop, and most importantly, the, the correction feeds back into the comparison. That's what the memory traces that get flipped behind, the cycle goes on and on. In fact, this is what um, Neil was talking about, recursion, feedback recursion. So this little chemical machine also, which is simply slightly fancier, um, peptides also gives rise to what's called quorum, quorum sensing, how a simple bacterium can um, read the environment to know of how much more of self or its other species in there so they can um, have collective behaviors. So you already see a me and a we identity and co uh, cooperative and competitive social regimes early on that are regulated by the system. So here's the big news headline. Emotion is actually a, an entire sensory system, the uh, grandfather of all senses. It's ancient hedonic qualia, um, of apparent in the pleasant and unpleasant nature of things we see, taste, smell, and touch, even our sense of balance. And we feel it in our own hedonic urges, our drives, our needs, and our um, habits, and conditioned habits and attitudes. Uh, even all evaluative language is undergirded by the, the hedonic qualia. And then now, after very, very ancient beginnings, uh, along with the emergence of the triune structure of the vertebrate brain, there are three levels of information encoded in our complex feelings, like, you know, um, trust and mistrust and envy and admiration, lots and lots of packed with information, all of which secrets spill forth when we can decode what positive and negative actually means in how we experience pleasure and pain, why we, those categories are there. So um, its vital, vital function is that of self-regulation, which it started out very simply, but now is a huge umbrella term, ranging from, you know, just, I mean, the complex unification, balance, protection, development, and actualization of all self-potentials, whatever they might include. So, I want to emphasize that the way that we participate in this is through our emotional experiences. You know, it's like, I feel, therefore I am, is where identity actually comes from. Um, so why is this news? How could we have missed an entire sensory system? Well, the answer is that emotion itself is largely missing from our scientific canon. There's lots of reasons, I won't go into them now, but it's pretty much off the table. These ideas of to put nails in the coffin of emotion pre prevented us from really studying it even. So at best, it, emotion is um, thought of as an animal throwback to our instincts, you know, bad stuff, or that it's hopelessly entangled with notions of good and evil and uh, sin and virtue and religion. But we've been blaming the messenger um, and missing a vital self-regulatory message. And as a result, throughout our entire history, uh, we've been handicapped, literally dis disabled with our most fundamental sense. Now, this is ground zero for most ongoing conflict and human suffering. It's unnecessary, it's self-created. But on a, a scale of one to 10, of emotional literacy and our ability to mine and utilize our emotional guidance, we're really at the low end. In some cases, even lower than raw animal intelligence, because our belief structures and our attitudes have disconnected us even from that level. So my hope is to begin to change that with this new science. And the work in general, um, is a, a, a collection of stories within stories that sort of retell our history with this piece intact. I mean, we have this sense and this is how it works. Of course, it's far too much to discuss today, but I'm gonna um, 
the, the, I'll spend this time in here talking about the, the, the big story that, that we do have this vital emotional sentience uh, you know, that I've just sort of sketched. And then later on, like everybody else is down there at the same time, um, the follow-up in the Monterey room, we'll, we'll uh, flesh out the second, which is the self-regulatory story, how, how this really shows up in our physical health um, and, and all of our chemistry and all of that, and what it means for the different pieces of the self. Uh, then we have the evolutionary story, how this shows up all across the animal kingdom and changes how we think about evolution, including um, uh, something that I'm beginning to call emo, evo, eco, devo, because it gives the credit of the behavior to the animal that it's due, and it credits the fact that we do have this binary signaling system that is a fundamental value system that absolutely gives us participation in natural selection, if not anything deeper still, which we're going to talk about too. So finally, there's the how-to story, which is really where the meat of this work goes, how to really decode and understand and use emotion in a way that can um, tap this guidance and, and, and put us up on the higher end of the spectrum there. So I'll begin now with a kind of a bare-bones logic of the process of emergence. And we know a lot about this, so I can go quickly, I hope. But this is a critical image because um, it's a common process across physical, chemical, and living systems. It's also known as self-organization. And my argument is that these self-regulatory functions emerge directly from these self-organizing dynamics. Um, so basically, it's a, it's a relationship between parts and wholes, how interactions in hierarchical networks, how parts and actions, oh, excuse me, interactions at the lower level give uh, rise to higher level global patterns. Um, and, but the, and that the, these are new patterns with new structures, functions, and behaviors that weren't present below, but that feed back and maintain the st stability of the structures that gave rise to them in the first place. Um, for example, Neil Thies talked about this, I love his model, it's wonderful, um, how atoms like carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen um, interact to create um, macromolecules like lipids, which can then make cell membranes that we've discussed, and then of course house the cells and give life to multicellular organisms. Um, and of course, the cells have this 5E cognition, and they continue to signal to coordinate through, through all kinds of fluids in the bodies and electrical circuits. But I want, to know, want you to know that um, the local parts interact within boundaries and simple rules. Uh, I note all the arrows in this image are completely ongoing dynamic process with bidirectional causality, feedback. All these things um, are reflecting the dynamic process that is life. So the take home here is that this self-organization process dynamic gives us three new ways to understand the self-regulatory function of emotional qualia. The first is that feelings embody simple rules. We've all heard the complexity mantra, simple rules give rise to complex behavior. And I mean this quite literally. Um, choice making in this context, uh, choice making is how uh, the simple rules guide the choice making, which is simply um, the ability to switch between binary self states, whether it's on or off or more or less or, or things like that. There's these beautiful binaries um, th that depend on the simple rules and uh, the activity of one's nearest neighbors. Okay, so they give rise to global, global attractors, repellers, phase transitions, and edge of chaos criticality, where binary computation, um, or the original form of information processing in chemistry, is said to occur. And we heard Jude talk about uh, fractal stuff yesterday, and I can't go into that deeply, but there is a connection between edge of chaos criticality and fractal structures. And feedback drives the iterative process. So there's a really deep, um, not even metaphors here, but information. So at, we're, we're talking about the recursion that uh, Neil mentioned. And sure enough, criticality shows up in migrating locus, schools of fish, flocks of birds, groups of mammals, crowds of people, as well as the circuitry, our neural circuitry itself. And as we'll see, the binary um, positive and negative categories of motion emerge directly from edge of chaos criticality. Um, and there are several layers, several layers of simple rules um, embedded in positive and negative categories of emotion, deeply meaningful rules. Uh, the second new idea is that feelings serve as positive and negative informational feedback. Feedback that comes in two types, you know, social and um, we know about that kind. It's like when you, uh, your job, your 
boss gives you a performance evaluation where you, you rate your own experience going through airport security or something. Social feedback is an evaluative judgment from an outsider to make adaptive self-corrections. Um, positive, but there's a deeper kind of cybernetic feedback. Cybernetic feedback, that's below, below it, uh, that we talked about in the little loop of mind. And that's the, the personal kind that's the most important here. And positive and negative has a completely different meaning than it does in social um, uh, feedback, although they're related, of course, by emotion. Positive and negative feedback, positive and negative feedback is a functional distinction here, where positive feedback occurs to chaos, change going through the system, and negative feedback occurs to homeostatic regulation, getting it back onto balance. So positive and negative, this is our first real clue that we've made value judgments that are not accurate because positive feedback, both positive good and bad feelings are feedback signals, and they're um, the correction, is the negative feedback response. So in cybernetic feedback, the coupling, positive and negative are, are about the double-barreled nature of qualia. So I'm going to make sure that we know that mis distinction, because nonetheless, in human experience, both uh, cybernetic feedback signals, which are categories of pe pleasure and pain, and social feedback from others, together provide the simple rules and the nearest neighbor information that guides our human behavior, our hedonic behavior, okay? So the third new insight comes from cyberneticist William Powers. And given that cybernetic feedback controls behavior, Powers suggested that the primary role of behavior itself was to control perception. So in essence, he inverted the idea of monkey see, monkey do, to monkey do, monkey see. But of course, I'm arguing that emotional qualia is a monkey feel even beneath the monkey do. So his insight is becoming important, uh, his insight is becoming apparent in the failures of artificial intelligence because um, the feedback inspired mind of you know, robots they're trying to build. But they've hit a wall um, because programmers can't factor in all the possibly relevant features to which a creature has to perceive and respond. It's known as the frame problem. Um, worse, um, one can't program a machine to control perception, to go out, to buy, to say, you can't program a machine to, with perception to control behavior when it's actually behavior that controls perception. So I don't think we need to worry about the singularity and the Cylons taking over anytime soon. That's my prediction. But evolution has actually bypassed uh, the frame problem via the self-relevant nature of emotional qualia. Pleasure and pain constantly inform us of what James Gibson calls environmental affordances, things that are potentially good or bad or useful for this or that, from the relative perspective of the subjective observer in its immediate environment. So affordances are pe perceived completely differently depending on who is looking. For example, the rock can be perceived differently by the man, by the cat and by the mouse for a variety of reasons. Now, for humans, um, our affordances not only conclude, include natural resources, but they can include all the cultural structures that we've built and, most importantly, our connections and relationships with one another. So um, good or bad feelings also alter the boundary conditions our social, of our social networks, moving us to empathically um, connect or disconnect from one another um, and moving us between that me and we uh, identity con construct, and they drive competitive and cooperative behaviors. And they're both important under the right circumstances. So all of these um, insights shed light on the, the functional self-regulatory logic that's encoded in, in, in pleasure and pain. Um, the logic links directly to what Neil Thies told us about the role of complementarity in self-organizing systems. There's far too much to say about this, but they all flow upward from the positive and negative feedback functions that I explained. So they deliver what Hans Selye called, it actually boils down to our st you know, stress chemistry that mediates a yes-no value system of the any living body. It's the same, living, same, same value system for any living body. 
um, which is why we experience Pavlovian punishment and reward. When we uh, ignore our self-regulatory signals, we're choosing uh, to compromise our physical health, um, allowing natural selection to basically winnow us out. Now, the, stress, the stress chemistry is notoriously uh, the, the singular actor in a lot of chronic disease and illness, so we really need to answer these distress signals. Um, or we will be punished. <laughs> but this is actually really good news because uh, distress, in Hans Selye originally, stress came in two types. The stress of the painful emotions, but the use stress of the positive emotions have never been all pulled together in, in understanding this function of emotion. So here's the take home message is in terms of informational guidance, um, there's a central complementarity in terms of meaning and pleasure and pain that they mediate two self-regulatory imperatives, purposes, if you will, deep, deep attractors, um, self-preservation of body and self-development of mind. Um, these are actually the criteria for natural selection, but adaptation goes way further. We've heard all about embryological development and how uh, the you know, phenotypic development and epigenetics, huge, huge category that we are informed about through our positive feelings. It's about chaotic change that's developmental. This is chaotic change that is self-destructive and we need to fix it right away. So the, together, these two imperatives um, if we're answering them directly, there's actually a third imperative that they undergird, which is the self-actualization of all of our physical, genetic, um, maybe even quantum potentials. So and when we consistently honor them, we're, we are self-actualizing. So this is kind of the key logic all boiled down. So there's no good and evil in this story. There's no good and evil binary or dichotomy, but there are right and wrong ways of um, responding, physical rules um, about states of being and becoming. So there really is a foundation for a, a global ethic here that honors all life forms, and it's the same ethic actually within all of our spiritual wisdoms, and yet we're hardwired with, this, with a chemistry to help us figure it out. Now, so far, everything I've said is completely compatible with classical physics. We have life over here. We have um, all this beautiful stuff. We have the preservation of a physical form. But um, all of this, of course, is mediated by the ordered behavior of electrons. So um, evidence is growing that there might be quantum effects involved here as well. Uh, there's, there are now a, a, a quantum effects have now been uh, suggested to be underlying photosynthesis, respiration, DNA repair, magnetic perception, bird navigation, and olfaction, our sense of smell, which of course is undergirded by hedonic qualia. So, so this really does imply what ne um, Neil Thies and Minuscat Kafatos suggest, that sentience goes all the way down. Now they got in trouble for that, and they call it process. I'm calling it process too, but I'm also calling a spade a spade, it's sentience. And um, so it suggests that there might be, uh, uh, that these are bubbling up from a deeper quantum underground, as Stuart Hameroff suggests, through mic microtubules, or that um, my husband Stuart Coppin suggests as uh, undergirding um, uh, a deeper quantum criticality that's actually a dance between um, classical and, 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 and quantum worlds. <clears throat> and this deeper quantum criticality has been suggested to be a, a new kind of information by, by Alex Hanke. So I'm, I'm suggesting that sentience might be our inroad to the deeper attractors and repellers that might tweak quantum probabilities up and down ever so slightly. So this might be the ultimate interactive dance between classical and quantum realms that we're participating in all the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So might it be that the monkey do beneath the monkey see uh, might actually be a monkey measure that our little E. coli, when he samples the environment, is also collapsing the wave function, perhaps. Now, this is highly speculative, of course, but there are profound implications for the imperative of self-actualization. When you put this in the context of Neil Thesis, uh, sentience going all the way down and, and a beautiful, um, non-dual self with a capital S that's part apportioning its, itself with these artificial boundaries or beautiful boundaries so we get this diversity. 
Um, it's, it's, I love that because it sounds like that's sort of what might be going on here. But the deepest meaning um, within positive and negative emotion as we experience, we've, we've said, discusses this chaotic change and stability. Um, so what this implies is that since everything is in motion at a quantum level, we don't have a need for the, the pull of stability anymore. That's a physical thing. What's, what are we left with? We're left with positive emotion, uh, or at least the positive pull, and the self-developmental imperative. So I'm suggesting that that is why we, we pursue pleasure and why complex pleasure is filled with um, our, you know, our curiosity and our wonder, these are deeply rewarding experiences, our oceanic sense of oneness, because it's about this developmental engine, this creative engine. And Neil wondered yesterday if there was any reason that this big unified awareness would have any reason to do anything. And um, it occurred to me that, yes, <laughs> because once you get rid of the polarity of stability, and he's talking about these compliments all the way down, you have nothing but change. And he was talking, um, his complementarity, he, he, he originally asked the question that Niels Bohr did, are there compl complementaries in biology that, like the ones in deeper physics? And what he was referring to are what's called um, conjugate variables, the mathematical commonalities across quantum, classical um, um, physics that undergird um, they're evident in gravity, in fluid dynamics, in electromagnetism. Um, they're inseparably paired opposites, superpositioned qubits with Heisenberg uncertainty relationships, where you can only measure one at a time, and yet the change in one influences the other. So at the very bottom of all this, all of these conjugate variables boil down to the grandfather duality of what's called directions of action that give rise to events of differentiation it's all about change over here. It's all about change over here. So when we talk about some deep informing process, it's all about change. So growth, ooh, one minute. <laughs> I'll skip past that. So this gives us new ways to think about the soul. We are talking about vital processes that certainly exist over here, but if uh, this other stuff might be true, and, it, and it's very interesting to speculate, and it answers a lot of questions. It gives us ways to think about um, our dreams, our mystical experiences, uh, our psychological disorders that, that go beyond what we think to be true about the boundaries of time, space, and self. Um, but also, too, it tells us about, you know, just oneness with a deep creative chaos. We're talking about creative chaos at the very bottom. So. Um, I turn back to the here and now with words from one of my favorite thinkers who said, you need a little chaos in your soul to give birth to dancing stars. But we are um, way, we have way too much chaotic instability and we need more of this. But if we really get this, there's profound opportunity. Um, it, it seems like once we understand our negative emotions and we work that out, then we, our consciousness is liberated to, um, to broaden and continue. And, and until we get that, we're going to... You know, so there's a safeguard in the system, a um, beautiful safeguard that we're not allowed any more creative freedom than we can handle adaptively. But what dreams may come if we do begin to harness this? So thank you for that.